we are not allowed to have any discussion of this at all. I love drunk people. Drunk people rock. <laughs> At least he's not on the floor this time, right? I love that. There's nothing like being drunk on the Holy Ghost. Best thing ever. Me and Stacy talking about that today. Like, ain't nothing, no high like the Holy Ghost high. Okay, either y'all have never been high before and cannot correlate the two, or a bunch of Jesus' second cousins in here, or you don't know what it's like to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You're going to have to change that. Amen. Oh, okay, I, I feel like I need to do this. And um, uh, 826. The, the Lord will anoint, because I'm going to wrap up this this series I'm doing right now. But I feel like I need to re release this word. I feel like it's there's, I have been fighting this particular part of the word, so we're going to release it. Amen? And we're going to receive it. Thank you, Monica. Monica's the only one who's going to receive the word. I bless you with that. May you receive a double portion of the victory that comes from it. Amen. And the rest of these losers can just have none of it. Amen. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. Little, not totally. Okay. I know some of y'all don't know how to take drinks, but it's okay. You'll be all right, I promise. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you too. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Seriously. Do you understand that chains, major chains have been broken tonight? That there have literally been people set free tonight? There are people that were in darkness that came into a new light. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No! Hello! Come on! I don't know, but when I got saved, I was loud and obnoxious about it. I'm still kind of loud and obnoxious about it, ain't I? When I get that, whoa, that hollering thing, I don't know what that is. I have no idea where the Holy Ghost I don't know if Jesus is a yeller. I don't know. But I yell, and he must be a yeller, because all of a sudden, it comes down from way down here. I, I sound like an idiot, but who cares? But when that happens, I know freedom's in the house. And then to look up and see people set free like that, amen. You're like, well, I didn't see anybody do anything different. I saw it in the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. Ah, stay focused, Annette. Stay focused. Stay focused. I can't help but praise him, though. I can't help it. Stay focused. Stay focused. Ah, okay, Mark chapter 11. Stay focused. Okay. We talked, we've been doing this series on fanning the flame, and I, I, we talked last week about what are, what are some of the life application things that we can do to make sure that we keep our flame burning. Okay, yeah, the Lord, uh, I, just, I just now put two and two together, um, just this second, that the Lord, the word that the Lord gave me on Sunday about the, the lamp and the oil, I think is significant because um, now that we're in the last days of this, that's, you know, part of us keeping our flame burning, you know, we, we want, we have to keep the oil in the lamp. Jesus is the one who turns the wick up. Yes, that's part of that's what he does, but we have to make sure that we're, we're filling ourselves with oil. You know, that's our, that's our process, and so that's what really what this is all about, is that how do you keep yourself full? Because if you, the, the problem with diminishing in the spirit is you don't realize it right away. If you cut a tree branch off of a tree, the leaves would stay green for a while, but eventually it would die. And that's kind of what happens with us in the spirit. We forget. We, our devotional time goes away. All those kind of things start to happen, and, and some of these things. And we, we talked last week about, first of all, Seeing Jesus and Jesus only, that keeping our eyes fixed on him, that when they saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw Jesus and Jesus only. The second thing we talked about was remaining teachable. The third thing we talked about last week was being a servant, and the fourth thing was being childlike. 
I'm not going to go rehearse all that again, but um, if you read the book of Mark, you'll see those things in that order. Um, and then we stopped last week on about getting rid of all doubt so that we can say to the mountain, be removed and cast in the sea. And he said, if you would not doubt in your heart, believe when you pray that you have whatever you ask for in my name, that you will have it. And so what we had to do is we had to remove doubt. Well, how do we remove, remove doubt? Well, we pray. When we seek God's face and we stay in a place of communion with him, and that and in our prayer life, faith begins to develop and faith begins to take over where doubt is. Faith does not take over where fear is, but it does take over where doubt is. Okay? I'm not saying you're not going to be afraid. The feeling of fear will still come upon you no matter what you're doing. I still feel afraid all the time. It's not about not feeling afraid. It's about believing what God says. And even though you're afraid, you say it or you do whatever it is anyways. Amen? So the next thing he says in Mark chapter 11, um, let's go to verse 23. We're going to try, we're gonna, I'm going to reiterate what he said here. We're going to go 23 through 26. He says, truly I tell you, whoever says this mountain be lifted up, thrown to the sea, and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes what he says will take place, it will be done for him. For this reason I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that it's granted to you and you will get it. Verse 25 says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Forgive him and let it drop. The Amplified says, leave it and let it go. That's a good amplification right there. In order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. Uh, but if you do not forgive, neither your Father in heaven forgives your failings and shortcomings. So not a popular subject when it comes to the soul. Unforgiveness is something your spirit's like, yes, yes, yes. I love forgiving. I love forgiving. I love forgiving. Your spirit is so excited to hear the message of forgiveness. Your soul's like, screw them. They hurt me. No. Did she just say screw me? And she, Yeah, I did. I said the word screw in church. It's Greek. Look it up. So we don't want to forgive people. You know why? Because attached to that feeling are real hurts and real people who are real stupid. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So your soul does not want to let it go. And your soul does not want to leave it, especially if you're a woman. Can I get an amen from the female persuasion? Not you men. We, <laughs> we like to rehearse those things. And forgiveness, because it's attached to pain and it's attached to anger, it's attached to a circumstance and it's attached to a someone. But can I tell you, beloved, forgiveness is a very serious subject. It's serious. And we have to forgive. How do I fan the flame in my life? How do I keep myself with a vital, intimate relationship with the Lord? We want to do everything but forgive. Amen. Lots of nodding going on in the house right now. I, the struggles that I've had in my personal life with forgiveness, because I know how to hold a grudge. Oh, I'm German. I'm really good at that. Just saying. I come by it with my DNA. It's genetic. And I am one stubborn woman. Amen. Set me free. You're my twin, so set you free. So <laughs> I, I, I struggle with it. I, and I will be honest with you. I'm just going to tell you because I have the only note I have on here is get real and get honest. Get real, get honest. When my dad, you've, if you've taken the time to who you are, you've heard the story, but I'm not going to give the whole thing. But I will tell you this. When my dad called me up the day before, he had to go have his radiation. He called me on a Thursday night at 1030 in the evening to let me know that he had cancer. I had to talk to the man for years. He tells me that. And then I hear the Lord say, <laughs> I have to go to his radiation treatment with him. To stab him, right? <laughs> it's what I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> no, um, not to hurt him, but <laughs> to release forgiveness. Well, I didn't want to do that, so I told God no. Um, and I sat back in Ricky's recliner and said, no, nope, I'm doing it. And so I had a nice wrestling match with the Lord. 
and he did win. I will say that. But I will tell you what, I, I told God, I don't want to forgive him. He doesn't deserve my forgiveness. That's, that's just, look, you've got to be real, and you've got to be honest. You've got to talk to Jesus the way you really feel. You can't, you can't, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be like, Father, I forgive them, because I know not what they do. And then you see them in the store, and you run the other direction. You have not forgiven. Oh, we all got our track shoes on, don't we? Wow. Or you're going, please, dear God, please, dear God, please, dear God, don't see me. Don't see me. Don't see me. Don't see me. You're like, you're a chameleon. No. I'm blending in with the aisle. Oh, you don't see me. What is that? You don't do that with your friends, do you? Now, am I saying you got to, like, be all friendly and love people? That, no, look, it, let's, be, let's be honest. But, look, you've got to be honest with yourself about the way you feel about somebody. And I will tell you what, in this church, whoo, Jesus. We got some people we got to forgive corporately. What if the flame that we've been asking God to release for us corporately is not happening because we're holding on to people who left, people who stabbed us in the back, people who talked about us? Amen. We got to deal with those things. I mean, what's y'all? This is not comfortable at all in here right now. You can see your faces. You're all just like, Whoop, don't think so. It's hard to forgive, but let's just say it how it is. You've been forgiven, and how dare you keep it from somebody else, no matter how justified you feel. And you know what? You may be right. What? You may be right. And they may be 100% wrong. Doesn't matter. Still got to forgive them. And let me say this before I move on to the next point, because I'm not going to hammer it too long, because we're all starting getting really uncomfortable. And we won't. We'll tune out everything else that I say for the rest of the night. Uh, (laughs) uh, Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an act of faith. Amen. So just when you forgive, you don't look at somebody and feel all warm and fuzzy. You're still going to have the issue when you walk up to them and you go, I remember what you did. Because we don't have the ability to erase our memory. But we have the ability, when we're in a situation where we're with that person or something rises up inside of us, to take that emotion that we're feeling. Because what you feel is not the real you. What you feel is not the real you. The real you is your spirit. And when you take that thing that you're feeling and you put it in subjection to the spirit of God, you will su- Look, I have gone from being literally, uh, I know you're not going to, I know it's not popular, but I found scriptures in my Bible that said kill them. And prayed it over people. I got so hurt. <laughs> oh, she did not just say it. Yes, she did. I was that upset. I got that hurt in church one time. I just wanted God to kill them. I'd feel better if they were dead. They'd be in heaven and they'd be out of my hair. And that's pretty much how I felt about it. They had wronged me. They had hurt me so deeply. I thought I didn't know if I would ever be able to get over what happened to me. Seriously. I'm not joking. I was that, I, I was that hurt. Whew, it's stirring up some things inside of my heart right now. Not, not like unforgiveness, but just, just the pain. But I went through. Where I was finding scriptures like David did and said, just kill my enemy, God. Kill my enemy. Now, see, we see the people. We don't see the spirit behind them. It's not the person. It's the spirit behind them. And we want that thing gone. Yes, we do. So I was just out of line. I, God straightened me out. I finally figured it all out and got it together. But look, it's hard to forgive. And then, you know, but, and I, but I know what it's like to forgive by faith. And every time I see them and be uncomfortable, and still say, Jesus, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this because this is obedient to you. Sitting with my dad during chemo and radiation was the hardest thing, and with his mistress was the hardest thing I ever did. Standing at that intersection with my dead daughter on the side of the road and forgiving the woman that hit me was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Forgiving myself for making a left-hand turn that morning was the hardest thing I've ever done. But I cannot minister, I cannot have effective prayer, I can't be what you need me to be, and I can't be what Jesus needs me to be if I hold on to the feelings of unforgiveness. We are stopping the flow of God in this building because we refuse to let people off the hook for their shortcomings. And they are no more or no less a sinner than you are. Amen.
and God's not going to erase your memory because if he did that, it wouldn't take no faith for you to forgive. But faith pleases God. Hallelujah. So get real, get honest, deal with it fervently, be humble, and start acknowledging it. Just acknowledge it. Just start being honest with yourself like, I hate them. Jesus, this is how I feel. I hate them. I'll be honest. If the man who hit Timmy was alive today, it'd be hard for me to look at him in the face. And even though he's going to be with Jesus, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, I've had to forgive him. Come on, it's uncomfortable. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. I'm sorry I didn't mean to do that like that, but I didn't ask permission. I apologize. I love you. And their process will take as long as their process needs. Amen. But as a church, we're all, we were all affected by that. We'd have people that loved, we thought loved us and walked out the door. Guess what? We've all been affected by it. And we got to be honest about it and quit putting on a little pretty happy faces and be like, everything's just fine. And then we're all Facebooking each other trying to figure out what happened, what's going on. We need to be honest about the way that we feel and we need to forgive. Amen. Amen. I love you. I love you in the love of the Lord. Number seven, the next one. Mark chapter 12. I will say this one, I kind of went off just a little bit because I told you I was telling you everything that he's talking to the disciples about. But this he kind of said to the Pharisees, but he said it with the disciples there. So we're at it. So Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Y'all okay? Y'all love me? Don't get mad at me. I, I love you. I'm sorry. I hate to bring forth stuff that's going to make you uncomfortable, but this is the way that it is. Okay. So he says, Jesus answered in verse 29, the first and principal one of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God out of and with your whole heart and out of and with your whole soul, your life and out of and with all of your mind, the faculty of thought and your moral understanding and out of, your, out of and with all of your strength. This is the first and principal commandment, and the second is like it. It's you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Beloved, you cannot take the first commandment and the second commandment and separate them. They are infinitely and eternally joined together. Because you will never be able to love your neighbor unless you love Jesus. You have a good love. You have a brotherly love. But you'll never have agape love. You'll never have a love that goes beyond unless you love Jesus first. You have to love him first. So that. He's got to be the priority. I will tell you this. If you're not loving people right, you're probably not in a good priority relationship with Jesus. Because the less time you spend with Jesus, the more irritating people become. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he's got to be first. He's got to have our all. You can't give him some and pretend that it's all. Cannot give him what did Ananias and Sapphira do? They came with an offering that made everyone think it was the whole thing, but it was only a part of it. Okay? So we've got to give them all. And quit acting like you're giving them all and you're only giving them some. We know the difference. So, <laughs> all means all. First means first. Period. So how do you keep your priority left? Can I tell you this? There's five things you need to do as a believer. This is my little nugget for you. This is what Jerry Fitch called Lon Yop. Lon Yop. I was right. Lon Yop. There is a restaurant in Destin, Florida called Lon Yop. For 14 years, I've been calling it Lag Nappy, just so you know. <laughs> it's not Lag Nappy. It's Lon Yop. Anyways, <laughs> amazing. How stupid am I? Okay. So, but if you... If you want to, because people have come to the altar, they've cried their eyes out. Oh, I love Jesus. I want to be saved. And they're good for about a month, and then they're gone. Then there's people who come to the altar, oh, I love Jesus, and they never leave. And they stay fervent with Jesus forever. What's the difference? Five things, okay? Think about five. Five is the number of grace, but it's also, if you think about your hand, the power, you've got the power to do these five things. First thing, read your Bible every day. Second thing, pray every day. The third thing is assemble. If you pray every day, you read every day, and you assemble with the body, then you have to serve. If you will serve in some capacity, pick up the trash somewhere, you're in here. Do, I mean, y yes, you can do ministry of help, but just serve somebody else. Find someone that needs something and do something for them. F 
find out what the body needs corporately, do something for the body, okay? You serve and you give. If you do those five things, 20 years from now, you'll be loving Jesus more than you do today. I will guarantee it. I will guarantee I, my life at, on the altar for that, those five things. People ask me all the time, how is it that after all these years you're still serving Jesus? I, I, I'm at church whenever the doors are open since the day I've been saved. And we had a lot more services than we do now. I pray. I read every day. I pray and read every day. I give, I've given my life to this, but I, when I got saved, I started, immediately, I started cleaning the front door. I started cleaning the bathrooms. I did anything I could do to help the body of Christ. And I began to give immediately. I did not have to be taught. about. I just, Jesus saved my life, and he got my pocketbook when he saved me. Hallelujah. Amen. I gave him my time. I gave him all of my energy. I gave him all of my money. I gave him all my belongings. I, gave, I would clean out my closet and give clothes away if I didn't have any more money to give away. I gave. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, James. At least someone talked about that. So you're trying to figure out how you can love Jesus more? There you go. Five things. Okay. So number eight. Ready? <laughs> Speaking of giving. Give sacrificially. Uh, let's go down to verse 42. No, let's go down to verse 41. Yeah. How uncomfortable would this make you today? If Jesus decided before pastors up here and he's praying, get your tithes and offerings ready, and Jesus just came down and sat right here, and he watched as everybody came and dropped their money in, and they left. They came and they brought their check, and they left. Because in verse 41, that's what Jesus is doing. He is sitting at the place where they bring the treasury. He is watching people come into the storehouse <laughs> and drop their offering off. He's watching them come and then go. Could you imagine how comfortable or uncomfortable would you be if Jesus was standing at the offering plate and you gave your offering every Sunday and every Wednesday? Would you be like, oh, I can't go up there. He may see it. Would you be like, I hate giving you this money. It's like he needs to pay a bill. Oh, I know what that was. I'm sorry. I love you. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, I get to give. I get to give. I could write a check for whatever amount of money it is. Because he loves a cheerful giver. Hello. Cheerful giver. Che the church should have a whole message on cheerfully giving to the Lord. Seriously. <laughs> y'all are like, your looks on your faces tonight at me. Some of y'all are like, I love you. You just always say what you, what you really want to say. And then some of you are like, I just really don't even like anything you're saying. I lost you at, I screwed up. I mean, whenever I said the word screw, I lost you. <laughs> Come back. Come back. It's okay. That Billy did not fall down. I did not get raptured out of here or, you know, killed. So it's okay. Jesus is all right with it. Okay, so <laughs> verse 41, and he sat down opposite the treasury and saw how the crowd was casting money into the treasury. Many rich people were throwing in large sums. And a widow who was poverty stricken came and put in two copper mites, the smallest of coins, which together make a half a percent. And she called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly and surely, I tell you, this widow, she who is poverty stricken, has put in more than all of the, those contributing to the, to the treasury. For they all threw in out of their abundance. But she, out of her deep poverty, has put in everything that she had, even all that she had on which to live. Woo, come on. See, this looks different for every single one of us. That is why it's not about the amount that you give. It's not about the amount. It's about what it is that's vitally important to you. Because until it is a sacrifice, it's not a gift. It's a tip. <laughs> so, I, didn't even, I didn't even write that down. That was Holy Ghost. I, when it came out of my mouth, I was like, oh, oh. Sometimes the Holy Ghost would say things. You're like, no, no, not through my mouth. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea how many times that's happened, actually. But he uses my personality. He loves it, even though you don't. Um, but we, if we're, if what we're giving is in, is enough, it's not. <laughs> it's not a sacrifice. Now, recently, because I write the same tithe check every week. And I do give more than a tithe. I've 
we, we make, we, we, my husband and I make things in our heart. We say, okay, I'm going to get this. Well, I, I really got, the Lord's like, you, you've budgeted for that. You're good with it. I was like, well, you, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it, Lord. So he told me to increase it. He told me what to increase it to. Well, on the first check, it's not that big of a deal, but I thought maybe it was one week. No. It's continued, and I'm feeling the crunch of that. I will be honest with you. But do you know that I feel more free and feel like I'm doing more for Jesus now since I've obeyed that? Because I wasn't, it wasn't a sacrifice to me anymore. It was a budgeted item, and I, was, I had to hear the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm, I'm not, this is not about you giving more money. Look, because if 10 cents is going to be a sacrifice to you, then you give 10 cents. It's not about the amount. It's about what does Jesus want. He wants sacrifice, and it's not even about money. It's about in every area of your life. What are you giving God? If it's not a sacrifice to you, it's not a gift. It is a sacrifice to me to pull my butt up out of bed, let me tell you. I get up way early, and I go to bed way late. And I don't get up every morning going, oh, it's time to spend time with Jesus. No, that's not how I wake up. Wham, I'm hitting my alarm, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, oh, it's not going to get up right now. Blah, blah, blah. I'm so tired. Don't you know how hard I work? Blah, blah, blah. I am justified to sleep another hour. I can tell you that right now. In Jesus' mighty name, I'm justified. But I want to live a sacrificial life, so I give him my time. I give him my time. I don't get up in the morning so that I get a brownie point. I get up in the morning early because I've said I have 24 hours in a day and you get the first. And it's uncomfortable and it's a sacrifice, but he gets it. People that applaud are devotion people. <laughs> They've gone to the secret place and they know. It is the best thing you can do. So don't give what you'll never miss. See, that's, what, that's the point he was making. He said, all the other people gave what they'll never miss. Rich people, it's easy for them to give because they don't miss it. It's harder for people who live paycheck to paycheck, who have struggle with bills. It's harder for them to give than it is for someone to give out of their abundance. And Jesus knows that. He knows that. So, you don't have to be, uh, your extravagant gift is not about the amount. It's about, is it mean something to you? And if it means something to you, it's like you may just have a, a watch, a ring that means something to you. But the whole you want to bless God or bless the, you giving the item away. It's not about money. It's you giving your, the shirts or the shoes away, all those things. Those, those are extravagant gifts to God, especially when you know maybe you only have five pairs of jeans and someone needs jeans. So you give them two pair and leave yourself with only three. That's, that's an extravagant gift for you if that's all you have. Amen. And then that person won't wear them or cut them up and you'll have to forgive them. <laughs> I had to do that. Amen. Okay. Y'all ready? Y'all okay? We're almost done. Here we are. Two more. The next one is to watch and pray. Oh, we're talking about prayer. This could go down as the worst message I've ever preached. <laughs> talked about giving, talked about praying, talked about forgiving. Watch and pray. He says in Mark chapter 13 and Mark chapter 14, he talks about watching and praying. He tells us to watch and pray for two reasons. First, in chapter 13, the disciples want to know about the end times. They want to know how they will know the end's coming, how they know that Jesus is setting up his authority and his kingdom on the earth. And Jesus tells them, I, all this stuff will happen in the end. But then he says, you know what? I want you to watch and to pray. In verse chapter 13, verse 5. He says, Jesus began to tell them, be careful and watchful that no one misleads you about it. And then let's go down to verse 33, because I don't want to read all of this chapter. He says, be on your guard, constantly alert, and watch and pray, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man already going on a journey when he leaves home. He puts his servants in charge, each with his particular task, and gives orders to the doorkeeper to be constantly alert and on the watch. Therefore, watch. Give strict attention, be cautious and alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening or at midnight or, or at the cock crowing or in the morning, watch, I say, lest he come suddenly and unexpectedly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to everybody, watch, 
gives strict attention, be cautious, active, and alert. Hello. So you can't say that was for the disciples. He's saying, I'm saying to everybody, watch. Now, in verse, um, in chapter 14, he says in verse 38, this is when, in chapter 14, Jesus is going, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he asked them to stay awake and pray. And you know the story, but in verse 30, blah, 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 eight, he tells them, keep awake and watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the first thing we need to watch and pray for, we watch and pray for two reasons. First, we watch and pray so that we can understand, discern, and know what the Lord is doing in the earth. And by doing this, this keeps us uh, in a place that we will not be deceived. It keeps us awake. Can I tell you this? That You know why? Because when you go to pray, a lot of times you feel sleepy and you want to go to sleep. Amen. Well, you shouldn't pray just when you're lying down. I will give you that. Don't start there. Start uncomfortable. Get on your knees. Little tip. Okay. If you get on your knees, you will not fall asleep unless you are really tired. But if you're on your knees, your legs will go numb, and you will, you will have little sharp things going through your legs, and you won't fall asleep. You'll be wide awake. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't go read your Bible in bed. Okay. So, well, you can read your Bible in bed, but don't do your devotion in bed. I mean, you're preparing to sleep, not to read. So we watch and we pray. We spend time with the Lord so that we can make sure that we're not deceived. How do you know what God's doing in the earth? How do you know what he's doing in your life? You're watching and you're praying. You've got to guard your heart. If you think that you know Jesus enough that you can't be deceived, you are already deceived. Hallelujah. You don't know it all. You don't, I don't care how many, how many uh, books on eschatology you have read and think you can write. I don't care. You don't know it all. You don't know when he's coming. You don't know how he. <laughs> what Perry Stone said, I don't care what Perry Stone said. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to know what Jesus is saying, okay? I'm not, I'm not knocking all the teaching. Look, I got them too. I read the books. I, I listen to all the tapes, all that kind of stuff too. My point is we got to be on guard. We got to watch. We can be deceived. And we also want to know what is God doing? What is he doing? So we stay awake and we watch and pray for that. And the second reason that we watch and pray is because, hello, you're weak. And your spirit is vital. And they got comfortable. They were not like standing up in the garden going, oh, we got to pray for Jesus. Jesus, help us. They weren't pacing back and forth. They were by a fire. They're praying, Jesus. Oh. They were by a fire, warm and cozy, and they nodded off. <laughs> There's a big difference. It's a big difference. And he says, the reason that you've got to watch and pray is because if you don't, you're going to fall into temptation. When you stop praying, I can tell you what, there's a devil at your door. You need to look at the weaknesses in your life and look at the places that you're not praying, <laughs> the things you're not praying about, because those things, that's the place where it's coming. Because it's not coming in the place where you're strong and you're vital, it's coming where you're weak. It's coming where the unforgiveness is in. Come on. It's coming where, the, where there's no sacrifice. It's coming where you're, the place where you're, you know what, I'll just sit here for a minute and doze off. I don't have to be that vital right now in this area because I'm so good over here. I'm okay right here. He says, watch and pray. Keep awake, guys, because in the place that you're comfortable, you are going to be tempted. We've got to pray. So he's telling us to watch and pray for two reasons. One, so we know what he's doing in the earth. And two, so that we will guard our hearts and we will stay vital. Look around. Where are the areas in your life that you're falling asleep? Where are you leaving the door open? Your flesh doesn't want to deal with it, but you have to. You, if you don't deal with it, you're going to enter a trial because of it. Okay? And number ten. Ready? This is the last one. Yay. Everybody say Hallelujah. Be expectant, which is funny because Jerry Fitch talked about ex being expectant and suddenlies and all that. But Jesus tells us to be also. And if you read the rest of Mark, and like in Mark, you know, it talks about Jesus going to cross. And in Mark 16, of course, Jesus is risen from the grave. He's, he's telling them that, you know, 
he wants him to make disciples of all nations, and I want you to go out and preach and all this kind of stuff. And but Mark, because Mark is the servant book, okay? Mark Mark shows us how Jesus is the ox. He's the servant. He's the burden bearer. He's the he's the one who does the work, okay? Oxen do the work. So Mark is the face of the ox of Jesus. And so Mark is so Mark doesn't get into the emotional part. That's why he's like, and suddenly and immediately, and right after that, I mean, he's like, boom, boom, boom. Mark, the book of Mark is like so fast, and it's always immediately right away, and you know, you're like, okay, Mark, it's not happening that fast. Give me some, give me some emotion. Give me some feeling. And Mark doesn't care about that. He's like, this is what we did. 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 So Mark doesn't give us all the part that I really want us to see. So if you look at uh, Luke chapter 24, Verses 50 through 53, and then we're going to end right there. I'm going to give you a couple other scriptures. He says, when he's telling them to go, he tells them to go. They're going to be clothed with power from on high. Hallelujah for the Holy Ghost. Uh, He says, let's go actually go down to verse 51. It says, and it occurred. That while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. And they, worshiping him, went back to Jerusalem with great joy. Great joy is the the point here. And they were continually in the temple, celebrating with praises and blessing and extolling God. See, they didn't go away sad and depressed. They went with great joy, continually blessing and praising God. Even though they did not know what to expect, they didn't know what being clothed from on uh, on high from power was going to look like. It didn't matter. They left that place praising Jesus. They had great joy. They were... They, they were happy. <laughs> Why were they happy? Let's see. They had denied him. They had fallen asleep. They couldn't figure out why he did. They did. They couldn't figure out why they, you know they didn't have enough bread to eat. All those things that they were mundane. They were ordinary. All those things that they were. They had messed up. And Jesus forgave them. And he said, you know what, even though y'all were kind of retarded in this last little bit here, you know what, you're still appointed and you're still anointed. When I called you up on that mountain and I said, you know what, I'm going to send you forth to preach the kingdom of God, nothing has changed, even in the midst of all of your mistakes and all of your failures. You are just as vital to me today as you were that day. So go with great joy and be clothed with power from on high. And they left his presence and he was gone. He was taken up away from them, and they went with a great expectation. And it says the entire time they were waiting for that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they were praising God. They were full of joy. They were happy people. They were happy people. They weren't sad and depressed. They had been forgiven, and they had seen the man that they loved with all their heart raised from the dead. And they went with great joy. You've got to remain expectant to keep your flame alive. You've got to continue to be expectant that God is going to do. That he's not erasing your call. He's not erasing your appointment. That he's not mad at you even though you fell down. These men screwed up royally. And still Jesus got to them face to face and said, I love you. Go wait for me. I love you. Go wait for me. And that's how we live. We live expecting God to do what he said he was going to do. And when they got clothed, whoo, they changed the world. They changed the world. Can you put up, as my last verse, a- a- Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to go Acts 13, 52. So those of, you t- those of you taking notes, Ephesians chapter 5, 18, Ephesians 3, 19, Romans 15, 13. You can listen to the audio. 2 Timothy 1, and 1 chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. There's some more scriptures on the infilling. Romans 15, 13. So, he says, can you do this in the New King James, this particular verse? Then we're all finished. It says, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that filled the house where they were sitting. And there, oh. and I don't read those. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were filled, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What's the next one? 
I think right after that, and he says, they call them drunk. They said, they, you're like a bunch of drunk men because they're all they're speaking in tongues. Because the infilling of the Holy Spirit will make you act different. It will make you, it will completely change your countenance. It will make you act different. It will, continue, it will make you uninhibited. All the things that you need to be when you're following Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives you that. You just got to get drunk with the Holy Ghost. He's so good. He's the best high ever. He is. He's the best high ever. And then Acts 13, the last one, verse 52. And you can do that in the app. Amplified. The disciples were continually filled throughout their souls with joy and the Holy Spirit. Okay. With joy and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Amen. They were continually filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. They were expecting God to do what he said. And expectancy breeds joy. And the Holy Spirit adds that to that joy because the Holy Spirit is righteousness, peace, and joy. That's, part, that's the kingdom of God. He's the carrier of, of joy. So there's a joy in our spirit that we're expecting God to do what he said he was going to do. So how do you keep the flame alive? These are ten things I gave you to do. I told you five things on how you can keep yourself in a place where you're not going to fall away from the Lord. Will you trip, fall, fall down? Yes, you will. Doing those five things, you probably will. doesn't matter. Mistakes are the teaching tools that we use to find the right way, unfortunately. <laughs> but I gave you ten things on how to keep oil in your lamp. Because, beloved, we know the story. And Jesus said there were ten virgins. Five of them had enough oil, and five of them did not. All ten fell asleep. All ten heard the bridegroom come. But only five of them were prepared with enough oil. It's hard to face. But there, were, there was a group of people that said, we knew we had a lamp that needed oil. We even had oil in it. And we knew there was a bridegroom coming. But they did not do what it took to make sure that they had enough. And they missed the opportunity to go through the open door when the bridegroom came. Hallelujah. So we talk about Jesus only and forgiving, removing doubt, watching and praying. These are not, these are not things that should be taken lightly. They are things that keep our oil full and they keep us in a place where we will hear the bridegroom when he arrives again on this earth and we will not have regret because we know we've been prepared amen i love you with all of my heart i'm so thankful for every single one of you thank you for enduring i love you baby you want to say something that we said what Amen. 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 Wise words. Amen. I love you. Jesus loves you. Amen. I call you blessed. Get out of here. Hurry up, get your Taco Bell for somebody else is in line before you. Amen. I love you. Put some music on, some happy music, not slow, sad music.